Yes, one, two, three. Anybody there? Somebody's light. Power strip. Brain. Brother Guy is um, the director of the Vatican Observatory, and if you're not sure what that is, the Vatican Observatory is an institution that was established by the Holy See, the, the Pope's office, for astronomical research and public outreach to advance the scientific understanding of our universe. The Vatican Observatory is considered to be among the foremost of observatories throughout the world. And it has a long history of um, doing the work of, of their, their mission. Brother Guy has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in planetary science from MIT. And he has a PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona. Brother Guy is in Italy as we speak. He is in Castel Gandolfo. It's a, uh, one of the papal residences, and it's just outside of Rome. He's going to be presenting a program that is entitled The Heavens Proclaim, Astronomy and the Vatican. And our hope is that this marriage will show, that this program will show that there's no inherent conflict between science and religion. Brother Guy will be giving us a presentation first and then he'll answer questions written by some of our own AP biology students. So as we begin, let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, loving God, during this Advent season, we remember all those who were guided by the stars to your birthplace. May we be guided by your light and your spirit to see your presence in all the events and all the people in our lives. May our Advent journey be a source of hope and peace, and may it lead us closer to you. Amen. St. Joseph, live Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So I direct your attention to our screens and Brother Guy. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, as I was mentioning, I actually have family and friends in Tom's River. My sister lived there for many years. I have two nephews who live there, and one of them has uh, teenage girls who are um, in high school right now. Uh, not at your high school, they're at the public high school, but they're doing the CCD classes towards confirmation. And um, I've been to your church. Um, it's delightful to be there. I only wish that I could be there uh, in person. I want to tell you a little bit about what it means to say the heavens proclaim. And I'm going to do that mostly through a history of the history of science in the church, of astronomy in the church. And so I'll start with mentioning how stars are talked about in scripture. The heavens proclaim, of course, is a quotation from the Psalms, Psalm 19. But in Psalm 8, we have this marvelous phrase that goes, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the world. When I, you have set your glory above the heavens, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them? You know, mortals that you care for them. And yet you've made them just a little lower than God. 
and crowned them with glory and honor. Sometimes people get worried that, you know, the universe is so big and I'm so small, how can God possibly pay attention to me? This is not a new idea. The psalmist 2,500 years ago was worried about exactly that. And it's actually a sign of God's infiniteness. I mean, either we're so small that God can't possibly notice us, or even though we're so small and the universe is so big, God can notice us because God's infinite. That's what infinite means, having the ability to pay attention to every individual. This is another one, though, from the prophet Baruch, and it's one that I love uh, because it's, it's very counterintuitive, not really what you might expect. O Israel, how great is the house of God, how vast the territory he possesses, great without bounds, high and immeasurable, who's gone up to the heavens and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? And yet the stars there shone in their watches and were glad. He called them and they said, here we are. They shone with gladness for him who made them. This is our God. No other can be compared to him. One of the things that scripture is trying to get across is that fantastic as the stars are, you go out at night and you're just amazed by what's up there. And it's so unreachable and so untouchable and you feel like you could never know anything about them. Nonetheless, we can know something about them because the God who created them created us. And this is a relationship between God and humans that a lot of non-churches you know, of the book miss out on. But, but churches like, like the Catholics, like the Jews, like the, the Muslims, who accept Genesis as a description of the creator, not a description of creation, because it's, you know, 15 or 2,500 year old uh, science, and naturally that's gone out of date. But the idea of who created the universe and how he created it, that's what's important in, in scripture. And out of that, we get a picture that uh, reminds me of, of what uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote when he said, you know, the, the idea of the, the pagans was that, you know, <clears throat> nature is our mother. But to the Christians, nature is not our mother. Nature is our sister. Not just a sister, but almost like a younger sister that you, you, you could laugh at as well as love. The idea that the creation out there, the stars we look at, are not above us or below us. They're not things we should worship or things we should be afraid of, but they are fellow creatures of the same creator. That is the message of Genesis. That is the message of how we understand the universe to be. What do we think of when we look at stars? A number of the popes in the last hundred years have described the relationship between the church, theology, and astronomy. Pope Pius XI, who was the, one of the big popes that really you know, established a lot of the telescopes back in the 1930s, he once wrote, you know, from no part of creation does there arise a more eloquent or stronger invitation to prayer and to adoration. I mean, when you're feeling bad, when you feel like the world is collapsing in on you, when, when nothing's going right, you can walk outside at night, look at the stars, and everything suddenly goes into a new perspective. You realize that the universe is so much bigger than whatever it is that's bothering you right now. And that is the invitation to pray, to adore, to recognize the creator of all of that hasn't forgotten you. Pius XII, the Pope after him, the Pope during the war and during the 50s, once wrote that man ascends to God by climbing the ladder of the universe. What does that mean? Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says, since the beginning of time, God reveals himself in the things he's made. How else can we recognize God except because we're mortal creatures, we're, we're things, we need other things, we need other you know, siblings of us of the same father to be able to recognize God. And it's by studying nature that we get to know God all the better. Well, here's a picture of me back when my beard was red before it was gray. That's a while ago, because um, 
you know, I'm talking to Pope John Paul II. The fellow with the gray hair in the middle, it's Father Savino Maffeo. He just turned 100 years old, still going strong. And in a letter about science and religion, John Paul II wrote, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. We've got a lot to talk to each other about. And it's important that we do talk and that we do listen, because it's very easy to, to be self-satisfied. Well, I know how the universe works. I don't have to study any more science. I'm getting along just fine. And not only do you, you know, not be able to invent new things or have a deeper understanding of the physical universe, you also miss out on the fun of discovering new things. And likewise, you can have an attitude towards your religion. Eh, who needs God? I've been getting fine, fine without God or, or worse. I've got my religion solved. I know the rules I'm supposed to follow. What else is there to do? I don't have to study. Oh, no, 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 no. Religion is not about following rules or memorizing, you know, any more than, than playing music is just playing scales on a piano. It's taking what you learn with those scales and learning how to make music, new music, different music, always different, always new. It's, it's falling in love with God. And when you love somebody, you never exhaust that person. You never run out of new things to learn about them. Pope Benedict was visiting our observatory here. This was in 2009. And he once wrote that the laws of nature are a great incentive to contemplate the works of God with gratitude. It's not just that the universe exists and it's beautiful. That's amazing enough. But God has given us the ability in our little heads to actually understand the universe. That's astonishing. That's completely unexpected. You know, that's more than a dog or a cat has. And we'd be crazy not to use and to be grateful for the ability that God has given us to understand the universe. Because scientific research can and should be a source of deep joy. I mean, why do we do science? If it's not because it's fun, then we're doing something wrong. Why do you, you know, practice in the football field day after day, week after week? It's horribly awful practice. And yet there's a satisfaction in getting better at it. And there's a satisfaction of playing the game. Why do we, you know, practice at playing music? It's hard practice. Your fingers get, you know, hurt and tired and, and sore. But when you can finally produce the music that was in your head and make it out loud for the world to hear, then it's all worth it. That sense of joy, that's a sign of God's presence. That's how we know that God is there, actually. So I've given you all of these popes. I'm going to end with one statement that actually comes out of this fellow with the familiar collar sitting in the middle between the Millikan on the left and the guy with the haircut on the right, Einstein. Millikan was a scientist who worked out what electrons were, and there's a whole story about him I don't even have time for. Einstein, you know, you know. Uh, e equals mc squared relativity. Lemaitre, between them, was another scientist. He's got a collar like mine. He also has an MIT degree like mine, but he was a French mathematician. He could read mathematics like you could read poetry. And seeing the mathematics of how Einstein de described gravity, he looked back and he said, wow, with this, it's completely consistent with the idea that the universe is expanding, and not only expanding, but expanding in such a way that if you run the movie backwards, you could see that at one time it was all at one very dense, very hot point. He called this expansion of the universe from a hot point. He called it uh, a cosmic seed, but there was a scientist who didn't like that because they didn't like the idea that the universe would have had a beginning. And so Fred Hoyle, the scientist who, who didn't like that and was suspicious of Lemaitre because he was a priest, made fun of this theory and called it the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, the Big Bang was invented by a Catholic priest. And he was very careful to say the Big Bang is not the same thing as creation. What do you mean? It's the beginning of the universe, right? Well, yes and no. Because the Big Bang is something that's happening within creation, according to the space and time that existed and the laws of nature that existed. 
God's creation out of nothing is a God who creates outside of nature. I mean, how does Genesis begin? In the beginning, God, God's already there. God's already there before there is space and before there is time. That's what we mean by supernatural. Not that he's ghost-like, like, you know, cast with a friendly ghost coming through the wall. That's not supernatural. That's just nonsense. Supernatural is more than what's in nature, more than the laws of nature. God creates space and time, and so it means that creation occurs at every space and at every time. Kind of an amazing way of thinking of the universe, something that science cannot approach. How did you know, church people get involved in astronomy in the first place? Well, it starts out as a way of keeping time. The Jewish calendar was based on the month, or month, as we might say it, and there would be, you know, somebody looking for the new moon. And when you could finally see the new moon, somebody would throw a blast a horn and everybody knew the new month had started. And so even today, Jewish, the Jewish calendar has months and feasts tied to the, the phase of the moon. Passover is the full moon. Easter, our Easter, is based on the first Sunday after the first full moon, except it isn't. And the reason it isn't was because by the 1500s, the calendar was out of whack. And there were people going around the world trying to you know, spread Christianity everywhere from India to um, the Americas. How do you know if it's Sunday in one part of the world and Saturday in a different part of the world? Well, in the 1580s at the Vatican, you see a little circle to the left there. Um, one of the popes, Gregory the 13th, built this little tower. And in that tower, there is a room with paintings on the walls of the different winds. And the south wall, there's a little angel with blowing the south wind. But then you can see, oh, let me get back there. Let me try this. There again. When the sun exactly crosses the midplane, it shines through that tiny hole and makes a spot on the floor. And the position of that spot changes as the seasons change. With that, they were able to calculate when the first day of spring was, and they knew that things were out of whack. And out of that, come up with a new way of calculating the calendar. Now, the calendar in reform also included a new way of calculating the date of Easter, and then all the other feasts that are tied to Easter, like, you know, Ascension Thursday. This guy, Christopher Clavius, was commissioned to write a book that explained all the reform in great detail. And in the book, there's a table that calculates the date of Easter up to the year 5000. So you can actually see for the year 2022 and 2023 when Easter is going to be. That's right. Rather than trying to keep track of where the moon is, they said, we're going to use a formula that calculates it. And you can take this formula anywhere. You can even take it to the moon where you can't see the moon. You can take it to Mars. You can you know, celebrate Easter whenever you want because our feasts are not tied to where the planets are. Our feasts are not something where nature is dominating us. The Sabbath was made for us, not us for the Sabbath. An interesting and different way of dealing with timekeeping that came out of astronomers working with the church. Now, among the astronomers around that time, there was a young astronomer who was a, a sort of a protege of Christopher Clavius, a fellow named Galileo. And uh, Galileo wrote this fabulous book. Here's a manuscript of it. Uh, describing them, watching the moons go around Jupiter and all sorts of fabulous things that he saw through a, te a telescope. But he was not the only person using a telescope. There was a Jesuit priest, Christopher Shiner, Christoph Shiner, who also was looking. The two of them both saw spots on the sun, and they had a big fight as to who was the first guy to, to observe sunspots. Turns out it was actually a guy in England who beat both of them, but never mind. What this did do was it set up a conflict between uh, some of the priests and Galileo about you know who was first and who was right. And I can't do this entire talk about Galileo. I could talk about Galileo for hours. He's a hero. He's a great scientist. He was a good Catholic. Three things you should remember. Number one, he was a devout Catholic even after the trial. 
Number two, he actually was never convicted of heresy. It's probably not what you heard, but no, no, he wasn't. And number three, the church was wrong to go after Galileo, whatever its reasons for doing it. Everything you know about Galileo is probably wrong, but it doesn't make the church look any better when you really read the history. Uh, the crazy thing is nobody's really particularly sure exactly what the reasons were that the people of the church, because Galileo was writing books and was a hero for 20 years. He came up with a, you know, the telescope in 1609. It wasn't until 1632 that he was actually put on trial. And then two years later, he was back writing more books, living at home. You didn't know that. Maybe you should read a book or two about Galileo. So here are some books that I found on, on Amazon. No, wait, here are some more books that I found on Amazon. Well, here's some more books that I found on Amazon. In other words, there are all these books about Galileo because nobody knows for sure really what was going on. And these are some of the things that people have come up with. That, oh, there was this conflict of worldview. But, but yeah, there's always conflicts of worldviews. That's how you make progress because you've got two different ideas that don't seem to fit together. And you, this is an opportunity to say, ah, I'm about to learn something new. Was it because he secretly believed in atoms? Well, the guy who actually did come up with the atomic theory was another Catholic priest. So I don't see where that you know, would have caused problems. He made personal enemies. Ha! Huh. He was an Italian. Of course he made enemies. That's what we do. You know, it's part of the, the, the shtick. The philosophers were out to get him. The Jesuits were out to get him. If only philosophers and Jesuits had that kind of power. Well, in one sense, you could say the book insulted the Pope. He didn't mean to. Uh, the book was actually approved by the Pope censor. And then six months later, the Pope suddenly discovered, ah, is that really what was going on? Or was that an excuse? The book came out right in the middle of the Thirty Years' War. It might have been all just tied up in the politics of the day. Crazier things have happened. Whatever it is, um, don't think of Galileo as proof that the church was anti-science. At the same time as Galileo, there were other Jesuits from the Society of Jesus writing articles about astronomy. This is a modern book uh, by a friend of mine, Chris Graney, on a fellow named um, Riccioli, Jean-Baptiste Riccioli. And Riccioli had a lot of fabulous work. This is Riccioli's book. And in the front, you can see he's talking about whether the system of the sun with the planets going around it is better or the system where the earth is still, the sun's going around the earth and then all the other planets go around the sun. And he tries to test this scientifically. And when you read it and you realize what they knew at the time, you recognize that, you know, it's not obvious who was right. That wasn't obvious. It's obvious to us now. We know better. But given what they knew at the time and what the telescope was showing them, it was quite reasonable to say, you know, maybe if the system doesn't work, just on scientific grounds, it has nothing to do with all it was against the Bible. That wasn't what the conflict was about. Interestingly, Riccioli is the guy who made the first modern map of the moon. He named the features on the moon with the names we use today. And the most prominent crater was Copernicus. And there are a bunch of other craters that I'm circling here of other people who believed the sun was, you know, the center of the solar system. So they weren't afraid of that idea. That wasn't an idea that would get you into trouble. Churches themselves were used as observatories. This is a big cathedral in Bologna. There is one of those holes in the south wall, and it puts a spot on the floor, and you can, you know, work out the seasons just because they could use the church as a giant, you know, a pinhole camera. This was the ceiling. This is still, it's still there. The ceiling of a room where they taught mathematics at the Jesuit school in Prague. Little, you know, you've got all these little angels looking through telescopes and they're looking at stars and all the stars are surrounded by planets and comets. This was being taught in the Catholic schools by the mid-1700s. This was not something that the church had a problem with. A hundred years later, I want to tell you a little story about this church. It's a church in Rome called the Church of St. Ignatius. And okay, there's a drawing of the church and there's a picture of the dome. The trouble is the church was never completed. The dome was never built. 
That picture you see that looks like the picture from inside looking up into the dome, that's actually painted in 3D perspective to make it look like you're looking at the dome, but it's actually a flat ceiling. And this guy was a Jesuit priest in the 1800s, uh, Angelo Secchi, and he decided since there was no dome there, he put telescopes on the roof of the church. Those are the remains of the telescopes that you can still see to this day. He was the first guy to observe um, and photograph the solar corona during an eclipse. He took the first really me good measurements of Mars and actually invented the word canali, but not me to mean canals. Looking at how solar activity affected uh, magnetic fields turns out to be really important to this day. This is a satellite that NASA has to measure solar activity to see if it's going to interfere with our radio transmissions here on Earth. The satellite is called the Sun-Earth Connection Coronal and Heliospheric Investigation Package. The letters spell out his name, Secchi. Secchi was also the first guy to take spectra of stars, to run starlight through a prism and see the chemicals that make up the stars. This changed the study of astronomy from a study of, well, where are the stars and what, what are the constellations to what are the stars made of? And indeed, what are their temperatures? And indeed, how do they evolve from one state to another? Secchi, the Catholic priest in the 1860s, invented astrophysics. And he was world famous. Um, the only reason most people in America don't know about him is that the English scientists were so jealous, and they didn't like the fact that he was a priest, that they wouldn't let his books be translated into English. But everybody in France and Germany knew his work. And he created such a great repute for the Vatican that in 1893, Pope Leo XIII decided what we're going to do is establish a national observatory so that that everyone can see how the church supports science. Here's a point where I want to pause and get you to think a little bit. You've probably learned all your life that church and science are somehow opposed to each other. I've just shown you church people who have been great astronomers, and I can name other scientists who are devout church people. You know, there's Gregor Mendel, the guy, the guy who came up with genetics. Mendelian, you know, evolution. There's um, Mr. Volta. Volts in your, you know, in amps. Volta and Ampere were both devout Catholics. Um, there are so many scientists who are devout, you know, many faiths, not just Catholic. You got to wonder why do people keep saying that? Oh, you've got to be an atheist to be a scientist. Where does that come from? Look, I'm a scientist. I've got my MIT ring. I'm not an atheist. Where did that come from? Where did that idea get started? It didn't get started with Galileo because Galileo stayed a good Catholic and there are a lot of great scientists and astronomers after him. It got started at the end of the 19th century. That's when the Pope decided he needed an observatory to show the world the church supported science. And one of the things going on at the end of the 19th century, here in America at least, was immigration people coming from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, Catholics, people with funny long names like my great-grandfather. To say that the church was anti-science was the first step of saying, and therefore we have to keep Catholics out of America. It was an anti-immigration invention of the enemies of the church who were trying to find some way of beat up the church. And, you know, a lot of it came just because the people who were immigrating here were poor and not well-educated. But now we've got Catholic schools. You're getting well-educated. We're disproving the whole premise. Why do keep people keep pushing this premise? Ask yourself, who's pushing the premise? Who's trying to tell you that science and religion are at war with each other? What are they trying to sell you? I'll just leave it there. Meanwhile, the Vatican decided to have an observatory, and you can see along the wall and the outside of the Vatican where the telescopes were built. One of the telescopes 
was a uh, fascinating telescope that was designed to photograph the sky. This was Father Lace. And every major national observatory was given a chunk of the sky to photograph. Italy had one chunk. The Vatican City State had a separate chunk. After the sky was photographed, then the positions of the stars were measured by this group of nuns. Uh, these were sisters of the child Mary and their work. They, they turned these positions into giant tables of star positions. In 1930, 1929, Italy and the Vatican agreed that they would recognize each other and the Vatican would be recognized as a city state. And this hilltop palace was given back to the popes. It had been the Pope's summer home until the unification of Italy in the 1870s. And this is where there are now two telescopes on top of the Pope's summer home. Now, the interesting thing is, that's where the Vatican Observatory was when I first arrived in the 1990s until, you know, about 19, and 2009 is when we moved out. That arrow points to where my office was. That arrow points to where the Pope stayed, now where his bedroom was, when he was there during the summer. So you can see, I was the one guy in the Catholic Church who was above the Pope. There were any number of uh, Popes who came and visited us, saw our laboratories. And even today, we have telescopes there in Castel Gandolfo, and a telescope in southern Arizona. The light pollution made it impossible to keep the telescopes going in, in Rome. City lights from Rome were too bright. So we built this telescope in a dark, dry site in Arizona. That's the site. You can see the telescope at the bottom of the picture. That's the telescope we have now. And I could talk about that telescope for hours, but, but I'll spare you. I'll just give you this as an image taken by our telescope of the Crab Nebula. This is uh, uh, an exploded star, a supernova remnant. And by studying the shape and indeed the color, we can tell you what, what materials are there, how it's moving, and tell you something about how that star evolved with time. I'm gonna move from there to something very different. This is something from my childhood 60 years ago. This was the cottage that my family had on the shores of Lake Huron when I was growing up in Detroit. We'd go up there and spend the summers there. And I remember once as a little kid um, playing cards with my mom. I was, must have been 10 years old, you know, just a kid. And it was a rainy day and you couldn't go outside. So we're, we're in the porch there, the place where the, the, the flaps are up. And we're listening to the rain and we've got the cards out. We're playing rummy. And suddenly I had one of these little thoughts that 10-year-olds will get every now and then, like, she's a grown-up. I'm a kid. Why is she playing cards with me? I mean, she could play, she could win anytime she wanted to, right? And the reason was, it was her way of spending time with me. It was her way of telling me she loved me. You know, your typical 10-year-old boy doesn't want to hear, you know, son, I love you. They're going to go, oh, mom, come on. But this was her way of saying it. And I was reminded of that one day when I was in my meteorite lab. That's what I do with science. I measure meteorites. I measure their physical properties. And I'm, you know, enjoying handling these rocks and just feeling a thrill that I get to hold pieces of outer space. But I'm also realizing that when I'm making these measurements and trying to figure out what's going on, I'm part of a wonderful game, a game that God has set up. This is God's way of telling me he loves me by giving me these wonderful puzzles to work out and the great joy I get when the puzzles are worked out. That's how I relate to God as the, the creator the puzzle maker, God the father, God the parent. I gave you something to think about earlier. Why does some people, why do some people feel the need to make you think that there's a war between science and religion? What's in it for them? I'll leave you with three questions. 
Oops, I already missed the three questions. Go back, go back, go back. Why is this important? Why is history important? Why is story important? If you see God as a parent, maybe that doesn't work if you know you have got a bad relationship with your parents. So can you think of other ways to think about how God relates to you? For me, God is the great puzzle maker and the God who says, I love you. Thanks a whole lot for listening to me. If you want to know more about us, you've got we've got a website, vaticanobservatory.org. And at this point, having talked to you for about half an hour, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it over to whoever's got the great questions, because now I want to hear what you guys have to say. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brother Guy. Um, before we get into questions, um, what a, what a uh, wonderful presentation that was. Um, before we began the presentation, though, uh, Brother, you and I were talking a little bit. Some of our students were here. But um, I wanted for you to maybe talk about what it means to be a brother as opposed to a priest or a bishop or whatever. So, <laughs> got it. Sure. Yeah, it's an interesting, I've got a long and, and crazy life. Um, when I was 18, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, because who does when they're 18? Um, I knew I was a smart kid. I went to the Jesuit high school, to the Catholic high school in Detroit, and I was a nerd. And my friends were all nerds, and that was fine. And I loved the Jesuits, because they're all, you know, deeply educated, and, and they, they, they looked smart. I wanted, I didn't want to be smart so much as I wanted to look smart. So... <laughs> I went off to Boston College, and it's a great school, and I highly recommend it for you know anybody who wants to go there. But certainly when I was there, mumble, mumble years ago, it did have the reputation of being something of a party school at times, and and I'm not a party goer, you know. I I remember once you know, trying to drink liquor, and it's like, this stuff tastes terrible. Why can't I just have chocolate, spend my money on chocolate, much more fun? That's the kind of nerd that I was. Well, um, I thought then about being a priest, and I went to find a, a Jesuit. And I said, you know, I want to join the Jesuits as a priest. And he said, well, have you prayed about this? I'm thinking, pray? I guess you're supposed to pray. So I went to my room, and I, and I thought, you know, God, I know, I know that everybody, they're always looking for priests. So they'll take me, they'll take anybody, right? And God goes, no. No, I don't want you to be a priest. Why? Well, in your case, guy, says this little voice in the back of my head, you'd be terrible at it. What do you mean? What happens with all the guys that, you know, that, that in your dorm when they, they have problems and they come and pour out their soul to you because you're the guy who's got his act together because you're not drinking on the weekends? And I think, and I'm, well, I think to myself, well, of course you guys have problems. You're idiots, you know? Stop doing stupid stuff. He goes, no, no, no. That's not what a, a priest deals with people with problems. He doesn't just say you're a bunch of idiots. You know, okay. What are you good at? God asks. Where are you happy? And I was happy hanging out with my buddy at MIT because they had, you know, weekend movies and, and tunnels to explore and, and the world's biggest collection of science fiction. It was a nerd school and I was a nerd. So I found the school that was right for me and I became a scientist. And it was 20 years later that I realized I loved being a scientist, but I wanted to do it for something bigger than myself. A friends of mine were getting married, and I was very happy for them. I was at the wedding. And I was really happy for them. But I was also thinking, oddly enough, that's not what I want. What do I want? I want to be a nerd, but, you know, to be a nerd for God. I've already done this. I already, you know, God already told me he didn't want me to be a priest. But it's not the only way you can serve God. The Jesuits have brothers. I'm not ordained. Um, I don't do the, 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 the touchy-feely stuff that I'm terrible at. But I can do the teaching. I can do the science. I can talk about you know, the science to people. Don't ask me to express my feelings really well. I'm, I'm not a poet. I'm a nerd. But that's what I am. God takes each one of us 
and finds where the talents are that he's given us. And then we'll open a few doors for us to peek through and see, is this what you want? Is that what you want? I spent a few years peeking through different doors before I finally realized to be a brother, to be a Jesuit brother. I take the same vows. Poverty, well, I'd been a graduate student. I was used to that. You know, chastity, well, I'd been a graduate student. I was used to that too. Obedience. Obedience says that when you join a religious community, they will decide where you're going to go. That was really hard to stomach. I wanted to teach. I used to teach at Lafayette College, which is this little school you may know across the river in Pennsylvania. And I really loved it there. I thought I'd teach at a Jesuit university. But under obedience, they ordered me to go to Rome, live in this drafty old library uh, in a palace where I have to look at that boring scenery and eat that terrible Italian food. And oh, yes, do whatever science I want to do, because my vocation is to be a Jesuit scientist. And oh, needless to say, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. But uh, it was under obedience. That's the life of a brother, being prepared to go wherever the church feels that you're needed. But on the other hand, know that wherever they send you, you are needed. And that's not a bad thing. And to do it in a religious community, because we're all nerds, but we're all nerds for God. Thank you, brother. Um, I think that's a beautiful explanation of um, that vocation that God has called you to. And you, you might consider yourself a nerd, but you're a great nerd. So thank you. <laughs> you don't get that compliment every day, do you? So we have some questions that uh, some of our students have prepared, and we'd like them to come forward. And uh, they'll speak nice and loudly into the microphone so you can hear them. And um, the questions will come. All right, Kaylin, come on up. Good morning, Brother Guy. Hi there. I'm Kay. Okay. And my question is, what made you choose astronomy as a career? And if you didn't go into astronomy, what are some other fields you might have considered? I thought of a lot of careers. Um, I was you know, the kind of nerd who was good at school, so I was good at lots of things. And my father had been a journalist, so I started out thinking I'd be a journalist. I actually was the editor of my high school paper. Um, I got a job on a small newspaper when I was, you know, graduated. So I actually, the day after graduation, moved to a small town where I lived in a boarding house all by myself and worked on this paper. I was 17 years old. And I discovered what the life of a journalist was. And there are lots of it, things I could do well, like write and write fast and, and ask interesting questions. The thing I was terrible at was going up to strangers and, you know, asking them embarrassing questions to put in the newspaper. I couldn't do that. Well, that's kind of one of the things you have to do. I remember once my first night in the boarding house, there was all this racket out the window and I'm, you know, I'm home from work and I'm listening to some music and I don't want to. The next day, everyone's saying, there was a train derailment right outside your window. How come you didn't go and take pictures? And I just wasn't curious enough to find out what the racket was. Oops, I didn't have the talent to be a journalist. I thought about being a lawyer. Um, I love to talk. I love to hear myself talk. Lawyers have to be good at that. I thought of, you know, but lawyers also have to be able to empathize with people. And, and you know, the nerd side of me kind of got in the way of that. Astronomy was appealing to me, in part because I'd read science fiction, in part because astronomy is the one field where you get to use everything. It's a little bit of geology and a little bit of physics and a little bit of chemistry and actually a little bit of biology now. So if you want to be somebody who knows a little bit about everything, it's a great field to get into. But also, I have to admit, it's my age. I was starting kindergarten when the first satellites were launched. I was a senior in high school when the first people landed on the moon. You know, the space race was the big thing growing up. And so that was, was quite prominent to me. But I think mostly it was that sense of being able to learn everything. That's what got me going. Thank you. All right, we have another question. Come on up. Good 
Good morning, Father Guy. My name is Bella, and my question is, how, if any, have you seen changes in astronomy based on climate change? Ah, that's a great question. Um, the changes are actually happening pretty quickly now because a lot of telescopes were built in places that were traditionally dry. But with climate change, the traditional weather patterns are changing. And it could well be that some of our telescopes uh, will be in areas that don't have as, you know, the clear skies that we're used to. The other thing, of course, is that it was astronomy that made us aware of the fact of climate change in the first place, because we were looking at the atmosphere of Venus and wondering, why is Venus so hot? Ah, the chemistry. Ah, the carbon dioxide. Well, wait a minute. We're putting carbon dioxide in our own atmosphere. Can you see the effects? Once you know to look for the effects, then you can see them. So it works both ways. The knowledge that we got from astronomy made us aware of climate change early on. This is not something that was invented by politicians last year. This is something we scientists were talking about 50 years ago. And actually, you can find it in the literature 150 years ago. This was something that we saw coming for a long time. And I hope we have a great debate over what's the best way to deal with it. That's where the debate should be. It shouldn't be a debate of is it happening or not, but rather, yeah, it's happening. And it's happening faster all the time. Now, what do we want to do? Because just because you've got a great idea doesn't mean your idea is really the right way to answer it. We should have a debate over what are the best ways of dealing with it. That's a legitimate place to have a debate. Thanks. Thank you. Well, next. Good morning, Brother Guy. My question is, when did you know that you wanted to pursue both astronomy and your faith? Yeah, there was never a time when it was one or the other. Um, since the earliest times I can remember, I had a deep faith. I had no idea where it came from. It's been inconvenient at times, you know. But... Uh, it's also been a rock that everything could be based on. At the same time, I had this nerd's curiosity about the, how the universe worked. I'll just give you an example of, 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 of a five-year-old's nerdly faith. It's Christmas time. I'm five years old. Some friend of my parents goes, oh, you're looking forward to Santa Claus. You believe in Santa Claus, right? And even at age five, I know this is a bunch of, you know, it's, it's a fairy tale story because I'm a nerd. But I also know that that's not what they want to hear. So I look at the guy and I go, oh, yes, I believe in St. Nicholas, because I knew there was a historical St. Nicholas. And you're going to say, yeah, this is pretty slippery. Well, that's why I'm a Jesuit. That's the kind of things Jesuits do. But I always had the two together, and I always was looking for a way where I could fulfill one or the other. That's why being a priest without being a nerd wasn't the right answer. But also being a scientist without having this religious life wasn't the right answer. I, I desperately wanted both. My science gives me the courage to do, uh, uh, let's try that again. It's my, my religion gives me the courage to do my science. That's what I wanted to say. It's because I believe that the universe was created that I have faith to believe that it actually makes sense, that there are actually laws to be found, and that I'm actually able to try to be able to understand them. And again, well, out of Genesis, every step of creation, God says, this is good, gives me the courage to be able to say, this is something worth spending my life doing, even though it's not going to you know, make me rich or get me girls or whatever it is that you know people think they want to do for their lives. It is for a deeper joy. And that deep joy that I get doing the science is the presence of God. So the two are absolutely tied together and it's never been the one or the other and it's always been that way for me thank you good morning brother guy my name is christine and my question is did your interest in science spark a deeper interest in your faith I wouldn't say that that's the way it worked. Um, what my interest in science and what, what I've learned from science has done is it's given me new ways of getting used to God. Notice that phrase, getting used to. I, I, there was a famous mathematician, um, 
I forget, Norbert Wiener or somebody like that at MIT, who once said about mathematics, you never understand mathematics, you just get used to it. I think that's true of physics. You just spend a lot of time with physics and you get used to this is the way the universe works. It's true with your faith. Yeah, that's why you spend time praying. You get used to what the presence of God feels like. It's the same, you know, in any relationship. If you've got a friend, a friend is not somebody who you understand, who you can predict all the time, but it's somebody who you're used to and you're comfortable with. And so my science has given me new ways of seeing God's action in the universe and seeing, oh, that's how God acts logically, but also beautifully. Notice those pictures I had of, of the sky, you know, the pictures we got through the telescope. Every one of them is very rational, and I can explain the equations that explain why they look the way they look, but they're also beautiful. And this is God. This is our God, like the, like the, the prophet Baruch said, you know, show me another God like this one. This is a God who creates both beautifully and logically. And that's teaching me something new about God that I didn't appreciate before. Thank you. Brother, that's a beautiful point. I think when we talk about the, uh, the design of creation and that it comes from our God, that God created things and he saw that they were good and that they were beautiful. You can use all the rational explanations, as you just said, about those photos that you took that were so striking. But um, behind all of that was this, uh, this creator of beauty. And with the eyes of faith, we're able to see that and to appreciate that. It's oh, we have a gentleman. Deeper, okay, it's even deeper than that because the very logic itself is beautiful. And that's why, you know, I can have fun being a nerd. Great, okay, let's see the next one. What, what, what have we got here? Uh, hello, brother guy. My name is James. And uh, my question is, has your time as an astronomer kind of changed your perspective on the Catholic faith? It does. And um, there are you know, parts of my faith that I used to say, well, I'll put up with this. And now I don't put up with it so much as I appreciate it. Look, I study planets, right? And I study planets at the Vatican. That means that on a daily basis, I'm dealing with people who you know, belong to a big, clumsy, stupid bureaucracy run by idiots, it seems, at times, who don't really know what they're doing, who seem to get in the way. Why do I put up with them? It's because NASA is the only outfit that at the end of the day, for all of its crazy bureaucracy, was able to get us to the moon. It's a real temptation. Sometimes people think I'm talking about a different bureaucracy. I was talking about NASA, of course. But uh, the point is that a group of people in a big organization working together can accomplish things that no individual can do by themselves, whether it's astronomy or trying to understand God and pass what we've learned on to the next generation. Um, it was in the structure of the church that I learned about God. It's in the structure of the church that I can talk to you guys and you know pass on a few you know, mild in, you know, insights about what God is like. Without this structure, we wouldn't have a chance to even get to know each other. And if it means that you're going to have somebody who's going to be at the bean counter making sure that you know the, there's enough uh, cookies and milk at the, the, the first grade CCD classes, well, so be it. We need that, too. We need all of the bits of society, nerd that I am, I could not do the work I do as a scientist without uh, the structure of all the other people who make this possible. And ultimately, it's what makes it fun. It's what makes it rewarding. So that's an insight I had about the church, that for all of its you know rigidness and bigness, you begin to realize after a while that this is how we can pass on what we've learned to the next generation, how we can learn. Um, there comes a time when you're growing up and you hear the church always saying, do that, until you get older and you realize what the church is actually saying is, no, 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 do that. Oh, no. Because, you know, we've been there. We've learned something. We've learned that doesn't work. And the same is true in science. 
um, you know, I was a student, I had professors who would look at me and go, guy, guy, no, no, don't do that. And now I've had students where I've had to say the same thing. But this is all part of the human adventure of having a community of people working together. We can none of us do it alone. Thank you, brother guy. Next. Good morning, brother guy. My name is Amanda and my question is, is Genesis the creation story a more metaphorical way to support the Big Bang Theory? It is a metaphor. It's not to support the Big Bang. Because the Big Bang has been around for 100 years as a theory. A thousand years from now, if we do our job right, it'll be totally obsolete. And we'll realize we weren't even asking the right questions. But we can only get there by starting with what we are now. Genesis is a book not about creation, but about God, the creator. In scripture, you can find four or five different creation stories. Genesis 1 is really different from Genesis 2. They don't even have things happening in the same order. Um, in the book of Job, though you think of it as the poor guy who has all these things, horrible things happening to him, read some of those chapters, and it's really God talking to Job about creation. There's a book called the second book of Maccabees, which is about, you know, Horrible things happening in Israel, and the, the, the evil king is forcing you know, children to be killed. And in the midst of it, the mother is saying to one of her sons, don't be afraid, son, because the God who loves you is the God who created the universe from nothing. Created the universe from nothing. That is a profound, radical thought, creatio ex nihilo, that is just tossed off by a mother who we don't even know her name. You know, one of the most profound ideas of creation. And you don't actually find that in Genesis. In Genesis, there's still this chaos, they think, because they can't picture what, what you know, creating from nothing would be like. But in every story of creation, three things stand out. First of all, creation occurs because there is a God who is not part of creation, who makes creation. Number two, he does it deliberately. It's not by accident like all the other creation myths of the people around there. This is a God who wants there to be creation. And this is a God who loves creation, who loves everything in creation. And those things are true regardless of what you think the story of creation is, whether it's the Big Bang or whether you think it's, you know, stars running past each other and ripping each other apart or whatever they thought in the 17th century or whatever we're going to think in the 27th century. That can change. But the idea of God who deliberately made things, made things in a logical way, made things out of love, that will always be true. To put it a different way, you know, scripture tells me who made the universe and science tells me how he did it. Thank you. Good morning, brother guy. My name is Camilla, and my question is, have you ever witnessed any miracles or discoveries in astronomy that reassured your faith in God? This is going to sound flip, and I'll, I'll start. By, by giving a flip example. When I was teaching physics in a laboratory, um, <clears throat> the fourth physics lab had all of our students hooking up oscilloscopes. I don't even know what an oscilloscope is. It's a big electronic gizmo. And back in the 80s when I was teaching, they didn't work very well. And I had never actually used one the day that I'm teaching my students how to use one. Every time a student had a problem with the oscilloscope, I'd walk over and look very wise and say, and so what's the problem? And suddenly it would work just right. I'm thinking, that's a miracle. <laughs> when the equipment actually works, when the science actually turns out to be what you expect. Yeah, that sounds flip. And that's not, you know, the kind of, what is a miracle? What is a miracle? Nowadays, people want to say that a miracle is a violation of the laws of physics, but that can't be right, because people talked about miracles long before we knew what laws of physics were. What did people mean by miracles back in you know, the Old Testament, before there were scientists? A miracle is something 
that makes you pay attention because it's so unusual. And it draws your attention to God. It doesn't have to be anti-scientific. It doesn't have to be against the laws of science. It could just be, you know, a divine coincidence. Something that you didn't expect to happen, but that every time I walked over to the oscilloscope, by coincidence, it started working. And if it makes me laugh and makes me realize, boy, am I faking it as a teacher here but God's with me, and somehow knowledge is getting transmitted in spite of my stupidity. That, to me, is, is the presence of God, and that's a miracle. When the right person shows up at the right time to be the friend you need just when you need them, that can be a miracle. Nothing about laws of physics, but it can be life-changing. Thank you. Don't think of miracles as if it had anything to do with science. And I believe this might be our last question, or do we have a, a, we got one more after this? Or two? Okay. Good morning, Brother Guy. My name is Andrew, and my question is, what is the greatest connection you have seen between science and God in your career? Joy. Absolutely, it's joy. Um, I'll put it two ways. One, when I discover something, I feel this, even if it's just, you know, this plot of data lines up with that plot of data, and there are only five people in the world who care about it, but it makes me happy in a way that makes me realize this is just a little taste of the truth, and God is truth. But also, I can think of times in my life, in my experience, when I was not doing the science for the joy of it, you know, long before I was a Jesuit, when I was uh, hoping to get a big job, when I was hoping to show up those guys at the rival university, when I was hoping to do the science for reasons that were not worthy, you know, I'm doing it just so my advisor will give me a pat on the head. Then I was not doing it for joy. And it felt dry and it felt like ashes. And even if I got what I wanted, it wasn't satisfying. It didn't make me content because God wasn't there. When you find the thing that gives you joy, then you have found your vocation. For me, it happened to be doing science, but everybody's got a different one. All right. Thank you. Beautiful answer, Brother Guy. Thank you. Gregory. Uh, hello, Father. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was, uh, what is your day-to-day -day life like as a astronomer? And a, uh, a it's, it's unusual because I'm at the Vatican Observatory, so it's a little bit different from what my life was like before I was a Jesuit. Um, I don't have to worry about publishing three papers a year or they're going to fire me, like a professor might worry about. I don't have to worry about coming up with results in three years or that the grant will be canceled. You know, I don't have to worry about that. So, and also, um, my job is not just to do science, but to show the world that I'm doing good science. So stuff like I'm doing right now is essential to the work that we do. Typically, um, I wake up at 6.30. My, my alarm goes off. I live in a community. So in our community, there's about 12 bedrooms, and you know, eight of them are occupied at any given moment. Um, so I get up, you know, go downstairs, get a cup of coffee and check my email, because I'm in Rome, but most of my colleagues are in America, so they've been writing emails all night while I've been asleep. Um, so I check email. When I'm in the morning, it tends to be when I can write the best, and I've got a lot of writing to do. Um, you want to be a scientist? You want to know what to study in science? Study writing, because no matter what you're doing, you're going to have to be able to write quick and clearly and coherently. That's the talent that you're going to need the rest of your life, and you're not going to get that at university. They don't teach you how to write at MIT. You're learning it now. So I'll write uh, scientific papers. I'll write letters to people who want to know about the work we're doing. I'll write popular books. I'll be writing, writing, always writing. Writing is the key to being a scientist, because if you don't communicate it, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. 10 o'clock, all work stops. And every one of us who are all in our little offices staring at our computer screen all by ourselves, we get up and we gather, this is Italy, in the coffee room where there's a big cappuccino machine. And, you know, uh, 
a woman who works here named Asunta who knows how to make the, the spuma. And we sit around and we chat, we, we talk in Italian, uh, you know, about things going on, what we've heard from friends, you know, funny things that happened to us this morning, whatever. So we've got, you know, a dozen astronomers and then five lay people who are the support staff who keep us going. So this is, you know, where we remember that we're not just the only people here. About 1.15, I'll quit my, 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 my computer, say bye to the lay people who are going off to their lunch, and the community gathers together for prayer, and we pray for 15 minutes, and then we have the big meal of the day. This is Italy. And big meal, wine. So, of course, I'm, you know, I fall asleep immediately. My commute is, my bedroom is immediately above my office. And, you know, the, the kitchen where we're dining is down the hall from my bedroom. So after pranzo, I go to my room and I take a nap for a couple of hours. Then it's four o'clock. It's probably time for me to get on. I do a lot of talks like this. So it's in the morning where you are. It's the afternoon. It's 530 where I am now. I'll do this sort of outreach. Seven o'clock, the community gets together for daily mass, which is in Italian. I've got to do the readings in Italian. Um, it's tricky. There are all sorts of words that are different in Italian from English, but uh, it's great practice. And then in the evening, the guys in the community may get together. There's a, a little attic area with uh, where you can get together and you know tell, tell stories, talk about what's going on. Maybe um, I'll go for a walk sometime during that time because I love to go for a walk. I used to do it in the afternoons. Now I tend to do it at about eight in the evening when it's dark. And I'll just go out into the courtyard outside of where our office is. And that's where I pray, because it's good to have an hour to pray every day. And I also try to get my 10,000 steps in. So I do both of that. Maybe I'll be uh, back online for some Zoom thing at 9 or 10 o'clock, because that'll be noon back in California. And then I go to bed, start it the next day. It's a really nice life. Thank you, brother. Well, brother, it looks like our time here is coming to a close. I just wanted to say thank you to um, Mary Beth de Blasio, who is our head of our religion department and our campus minister. She uh, was the one who first brought this to me and to our principal, uh, Mrs. Kelly. And it was Mary Beth who got busy on the computer and started this conversation with you. And I am so, so very grateful that you were able to do this for us. We wish you well and uh, continued success in your work. And I think so beautifully put that um, the product and the blessing of so much of the work that you do is that uh, thing called joy. And uh, when we find joy and when it becomes a part of our life, it is a really great blessing. You've been a joy to us. I wish you well. And when you come to New Jersey, come and see us. Okay. I shall. God Thank you and pray for me as well. <laughs>